Viviana, we can start. Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon. Um, thank you for joining us, joining us um, for today's session. So this is our very last session of the Organizing for Good campaign. Um, let me get it started. About one year ago, Andy kicked off our Organizing for Good campaign with a thought-provoking session on managing organizational change. Um, Andy passed away five days ago. Um, so I would really like to take a moment for us to remember Andy's contribution to the field of organizational design and his generosity as a colleague and as a mentor for many of us. So I'm also really honored to be the last person um, to um, conclude this wonderful series of sessions. And today we're going to talk about the future of organizing and organizing for the future. And I'm very happy um, and quite grateful for our three panelists who are joining us today. Kati Hemmerich from the United Nations, Sebastian Burgo, um, who is the founder of HOP, which is a blockchain-based startup organized as the DAO. And finally, Jerry Ney, he is going to share with us um, a series of very interesting experiments on um, different ways of organizing. And let me also briefly um, talk about the agenda of today. I will give a very brief introduction. Then I will hand over to our wonderful panelists and each of them will have 15 minutes for presentation and then a five minute for immediate uh, Q&A session. And in the end, we will have about half an hour for general discussion and Q&A. Let's go back to the topic of today. So organizing for the future, why should we care about organizing? If we are thinking about the future, if we look into the Milky Way, the galaxy we are um, living in, I wonder if you have been wondering why, um, why haven't we seen any other civilization, the technologically advanced ones? If we look at our own species, it only took humans about a thousand years um, to see really big technological leaps. If it only takes such a brief time in history, so comparing to our species history, this past thousand years that we have experienced the technological advancement, it is really quite brief in our history. So why don't we see any other species that are technologically advanced or more advanced than us in our galaxy or any other galaxies? One hypothesis is that social animals are not able to handle the type of technological advancement because once the technology is so advanced, such as uh, advanced to uh, the type of things as nuclear power, then some individuals within that um, species will have the, the possibility or power to destroy um, the entire species. So if we look at uh, humans, as a species, there is around 5% within our adult population that's actually um, have the um, psychopath. So that's based on psychology meta-analysis result. It's about 5%. So there is really a non-zero chance for these um, small percentage of individuals to reach to the top and have the power that can motivate uh, an army or multiple group of people. So if we think about the very recent crisis, so this is really a known zero percentage. Um, the question I would like to ask today is that, is there any governance mechanism or the way to organize um, our collaboration um, as a species that could effectively curb this known zero probability? I would like to start showing you some um, progress in different technologies. I'm just gonna take uh, transportation as an example. Around 500 BC, 
um, back in the Roman Republic, we have seen the horse carriage. And then at around um, 1900, the Wright brothers have brought us the flying machines. And then finally this year, the Falcon 9 has, um, has seen its 154th launch. So here is the um, really significant advancement in one particular type of technology. But if we move on to look at organizing as humanity's oldest technology, I really don't have um, not so many pictures as the previous example to show you. All I have is the remains from the Roman Forum, which was the place where public issues were debated and the public meetings were held. Already in the Roman Republic, um, we have replaced the monarchy with a representative um, democracy. But ever since then, there are not so many innovations in organizing as a technology to talk about, except for perhaps the two organizations we are going to hear from today, which are the United Nations and DAO, Decentralized Autonomous Organizations. I am a Trekkie myself, so um, I really would like to show you the intergalactic influence of the United Nations. Um, if you are also a Trekkie, you will see the parallel in between these two organizations, both in terms of its mission and the uh, timeline of development. Both organizations, the UN and the Federation, are set up after some major crisis to maintain uh, either uh, the peace on Earth or the peace in the galaxy. So we can, we can see the development and the mission of these uh, two organizations. That's why I, I, I really think the UN, although an ancient organization, has profound implications for our future. Next is the DAO. Many of us come to associate DAO as the future of organizing. So what is the DAO? Um, here I took the, um, the two popular definitions from Wikipedia, which is the source of our knowledge. It is an organization constructed by rules encoded in algorithm and that is not controlled by a central government, or we can look at it as a member owned community without central leadership. Um, these two organizations seem drastically different, but if you really look at the way they do things and the topics that they discuss and voted uh, within these organizations, you can see they are actually quite similar. For example, if you look at the voting topics in the UN, um, they mainly concern the governance policies, the allocation of budget, or uh, certain changes uh, regarding the members' rights. And similarly, within uh, the DAO, you also see um, the same type of issues being debated and voted and decided on. And next, I see the major commonalities between these two types of organizations. As, um, the first is about how power is distributed. And the next one is how they actually come to make decisions. But of course, this type of uh, decision-making or governance structure all come with its challenges. Um, for example, regarding the decision speed and decision quality. And here is where uh, we can learn a lot from uh, Jared and his um, uh, collaborators' experiments. Later, I think Jared will tell us a lot about the pros and cons associated with different types of decision-making process. So that's my very brief introduction. Without further ado, I will give the floor to our wonderful panelists and starting with Patty. Okay, good morning, good afternoon all. Um, so hang on, let me just share my slides. All right. Hopefully you can see those slides. 
my name is Katja Hemrick, as Viviana said. Um, I'm currently the Chief of Training and Development at the UN's Department of Safety and Security, where we're working on uh, a number of departmental change initiatives. And previously, I've been involved in other reform initiatives, um, also at the secretariat level, um, in other roles as, uh, for instance, the Chief of Career Support and Performance Management. And so I've been involved in a number of different decision-making processes. And, and um, for the reasons Viviana actually just outlined, um, that was why she asked me to, to make a contribution to this discussion and, and describe one of our examples of decision-making at the UN. Um, and so I'm very pleased to, uh, to be joining this discussion. Um, for those non-UN colleagues, just very briefly um, to contextualize a little bit where my example is coming from, um, you know, let me just describe a little bit how the UN system works in the different entities. So you'll see on the left, on le on the left um, we've got a number of what we call UN agencies, funds and programs, which are the ones that um, uh, the public are generally the most familiar with. So obviously on the bottom, we have UNHCR, the UN's refugee agency, which is also, I think, the, the co-host or co-initiator of this Organizing for Good series, and UNICEF and World Food Program are some that, that are very common in the media and that you're familiar with. Um, separately from those UN agencies, we have on the right a number of the intergovernmental entities um, of the United Nations. So you have the, the General Assembly and the Security Council, for instance, that Viviana mentioned, um, and you also have the Secretariat, which is where I work, which in principle, we are set up as civil servants to support or service these, these different entities. Um, All together, we are slightly differently structured <laughs> and we work in slightly different ways um, because, of, because we're structured differently. Um, but ultimately, all the different parts of the UN were part of what we call one UN family. Um, and we all ultimately work towards and together with member states um, in achieving the sustainable development goals, which I think is the, the framework also for this, um, the broader series. So more specifically, the example that I wanted to look at today of uh, decision-making is the UN General Assembly, um, where we have 193 member states and each member state has an equal vote. Um, and more specifically within that, I wanted to take a look at what we call the fifth committee. So the General Assembly divides itself into different committees by topic. And the fifth committee is the one that deals with administrative and budgetary issues. Um, and very specifically is the committee that will approve the, the UN's budget. And so that's actually the one of the main reasons that I wanna focus on the, uh, the fifth committee because we have a system, um, again, for the intergovernmental part and for the secretariat, we have a system of what is called assessed funding. And so what that means essentially is once the member states have uh, reviewed and agreed to our budget proposal, they all have to pony up and pay their share of that. So it's uh, the fifth committee decisions are ones where we have a very immediate and direct consequence for member states of that decision, which is different than in some of the other committees. So for instance, Viviana and I were discussing, you might have in the third committee where they could adopt a new human rights treaty, for instance, um, and they can all agree to that treaty in the third committee and in the general assembly sessions. But as a human rights treaty, each member state still needs to go through their own internal legislative processes in, in order to ratify that human rights treaty and have it actually apply to them. So there aren't actually that many direct consequences to that decision to agree to a human rights, uh, a human rights treaty, for instance, as there are in the fifth committee and the budget. Um, because like I say, once, once they agree to it, they have to all pay their share. So the other reason that the fifth committee is, is a kind of interesting and unique example is because um, the General Assembly in, in late 1986 very specifically agreed and has a resolution saying that the, the fifth committee must achieve the broadest possible agreement in passing the budget. Um, and this came about in part because there was a, a, larger, a larger financial crunch at that point in time. Um, and there were a number of concerns from some of the larger member states and the bigger contributors um, about how the decision-making process worked. And very specifically, for instance, you had in 1985, the US Congress had passed a, a unilateral cap on what the US was willing to pay as a, part of its share for the UN budget. So there was clearly a problem that needed to be addressed and needed to be solved. Um, in usual UN fashion, there were quite a number of different committees and recommendations that went through. 
But what they actually ultimately agreed on was this, this very basic agreement that going forward, the budget actually should be adopted um, with the broadest possible agreement, which is interpreted essentially as uh, being adopted by consensus, or more specifically, what we call adopted without a vote. Um, and the fifth committee actually takes this very seriously. And so on the right side in the graphic, I've outlined um, with the green boxes each time that the budget resolution was adopted without a vote. Um, and so you can see it holds actually quite strongly. Um, for a long time, we had a biennial budget. So that's why you see two years in the first slides. And then in 2020, we switched to an annual budget. But as you can see, they have pretty consistently since they agreed on this resolution, um, adopted the budget without a vote, except for 2021, where the United States and Israel were the, were the only two countries who have voted against, um, against the budget resolution. Um, but the following year, we actually moved back to, to the consensus and, and maintained that process. So here in this slide, I've outlined a little bit how it works. Um, so, which um, I'm gonna describe a little bit, you know, having, having been involved in this, how this actually works in practice. And so, the first step of um, the entire sort of budget discussion and, and consensus building process is that you will have um, the secretary have a secretary general's report. So essentially, um, it's in the name of the secretary general, and that report gets formally presented to the fifth committee. Um, it's not actually done by the secretary general himself, um, but it's divided up. Each department will have their own part of the budget and the head of that department will essentially present it formally to the, to the fifth committee. Everyone knows that the consensus is not gonna be achieved right away. And so that's where you just literally present it. There's no questions at that point. And the discussion will close and move into the sort of first phase, which is known as the formal informals. So we're, we're gonna give you some UN lingo here, which um, we have our own ways of, <laughs> of describing things. but. These are the formal informals. And so in the formal informals, here's where you start a little bit more of the discussion. And generally this takes the form of the secretary of department presenting in, in more detail what they have in their, in their budget proposal and why. And they'll be subjected to um, a, a series of questions from the, the, the full set of member states involved in the fifth committee. And um, not, every, not all of the 193 member states necessarily show up to the fifth committee. They work in regional groups, but in principle, anybody is open, any of the member states are open to come to these meetings. And so it goes through quite a, a detailed series of questioning. In some cases, for those of us who have a little bit more experience in this, you'll start to notice that sometimes the questions really are directed at us when they want an answer um, from the secretariat, or alternatively, sometimes a question is really actually a statement already of some of their positions and what their key issues are vis-a-vis -vis other member states or other regional groups. And so, you know, you, you start to learn through experience, which are the questions which we really need to answer, which are the questions that weren't actually really intended for us, and we can leave those aside a little bit or, or um, give, a, a, give a vaguer answer. And so throughout that process, um, again, you'll start to see certain positions um, being refined. And in parallel, the regional groups will also start to meet separately and start to refine their own positions. Um, and slowly the, the points of agreement and the points of disagreement start to come out. Um, and in most cases, there's still enough points of disagreement that we then move into the informal, informals. Um, and so this is another set of meetings, um, sometimes in the same room, sometimes they move to a different room. But here's where, again, you may have some direct debate actually between the different countries and between the different groups. The secretariat, we may be invited back to answer further questions or to provide some feedback on some potential compromises that they're looking at um, so that they understand what the impact of some of their agreements and compromise might be on, on us and our operations. Um, and so it's really, there's a lot of back and forth. And in parallel, though, we'll, there will also be what, we, I, what are sometimes called either least formals or political meetings, or they're as simple as um, a number of representatives getting together for coffee outside the Vienna Cafe. For those who are familiar with the, the UN building in New York, the Vienna Cafe is really a hub of negotiation in the fall. Um, and so people, emissaries between different groups will be going back and forth to try and find different um, points of agreement um, and how they can refine some of these, these issues of contention and find mutually agreeable solutions. 
Um, one of the key elements or, or key actors in this process as well is really the coordinator. Um, and so what happens, the coordinator is essentially one of the member state representatives who takes on a more neutral role. And so they essentially give up very much their, their own national um, negotiating position and rather become the coordinator of the issue. And the coordinator is in charge essentially of finding that consensus. Um, and these are really actually very, very skilled negotiators. And when you see them work, I mean, they really, they're very, they're very good at understanding the issues and following the momentum of discussion. And they have an important role in managing how those discussions happen. And so what you'll see very often also is they gauge the, the momentum of the discussion. If things are going well, they will keep people in the room. Again, they are the ones who decide when we get invited to provide more information or when we get kicked out of the room. So they will do that on occasion as well when they realize it's better for them to discuss things in private without the secretariat. And so we get, we get moved out of the meeting. Um, I've also seen a number of coordinators who I think work on the basis also of trying to find consensus a little bit through exhaustion, because as you start to get closer to our deadline, which is really the, the, the Christmas break and all the diplomats would like to go home at that point. So as you start to head into November, late November and early December, um, very often they're the ones who will just keep the discussion going, even if it looks like it's going in circles and they will go through you know, all night over on the weekends. I've been involved in discussions that ended at 3.30 a.m. on a Sunday morning, and the idea is really, I think, sometimes that, you know, we just need to plug through it and find a solution, and we're going to sit here until we find it. Um, so they're very good at, at managing those different discussions. And so, as you've seen from the previous slide, to a large degree, actually, almost always, this does end up working. And so you'll see with the budget resolutions also, they're usually adopted on the 24th of December. So it really comes down to that last minute agreement. Um, but it does actually work. And so once you have agreement at the fifth committee, then they will formally adopt it and gavel the resolution essentially at the Gener General Assembly plenary. So GA is short for General Assembly. I apologize, the UN, we like our acronyms. Um, so, and the, the General Assembly plenary, it will follow exactly what the agreement was in the fifth committee. So member states and the regional groups are very strict at maintaining their position. So no one, no one would ever agree to something in the fifth committee and then suddenly change their vote in the plenary. Or for instance, in the 2021 case where they actually did vote, it was clear beforehand, they knew exactly how that vote was gonna play out. But again, everybody stuck to their positions and it moves forward that way. Um, so, you know, I think from, from the outside, you know, this can look like a very sort of inefficient process. It is certainly extremely labor intensive. Um, but the reason that I find the fifth committee so interesting as an example, we have a lot of discussions um, in the media and elsewhere around, you know, the weaknesses of multilateralism or the weakness of the UN. But to me, the fact that the member states really invest this much time and effort every year, every fall, um, in order to find a consensus, and, and they pretty consistently do find a consensus on the budget, and then pay the money to, for that budget, um, to me, it's really a sign that there actually is a sense among all member states that the UN does add value and that we are a tool for collective action moving forward. And so imperfect and, and slow as the decision making process might be, to me, it's really a sign of confidence that, that there is some value in having a tool like the UN for collective decision making. And so that was, I think, the reason that one of the reasons we wanted to highlight that today. And um, again, look at some of the parallels with other ways of organizing. So. Let me maybe stop there. Um, and I think Viviana, did you wanna open for questions now or do you wanna do the other presentations next? Yeah, we can have a few minutes for the immediate questions. Do you want me to, I see Rich's uh, hand, so. Uh, yes, uh, if I may ask, uh, how, much, how much does the budget change from one year to the next and what are the, nature of the contentious issues? <laughs> that is a good question. Um, so yeah, on your first question, um, the budget, it depends on which budget. So the budgets for peacekeeping have historically changed quite a bit. 
Um, interestingly enough, the what we call the, the regular budget essentially for, for everything else, um, in real terms, when you take into account inflation and um, changes in currency, um, the actual real budget of the UN has remained static for, I think, almost the last 20 years. There is a real resistance to member states um, in terms of increasing the budgets. And similarly, the peacekeeping budgets have traditionally actually been decreasing from year to year. On occasion, depending on the situation, if there's a new peacekeeping mission somewhere, obviously it might go up um, to a certain extent, but there's been a lot of downward pressure on the budget. And that then, of course, leads to a number of the contentious issues. So um, it can vary. I mean, traditionally, the areas of contention tend to usually be, well, one around anything that is an increase, quite frankly, <laughs> um, is automatically contentious. Um, but you will have a lot of these issues in recent years um, actually around the, the organization and the structure of the UN. So here again is where the fifth committee has become quite important because you'll hear every new secretary general since Kofi Annan um, has come up with essentially what they call a large reform proposal. And, and um, a lot of that is very much focused on the bureaucracy and you know the different phrases of making the UN fit for purpose. Um, making our rules um, a little bit more operational so we can we can move faster in the field, um, you know, improving our management of human resources. Um, and those actually are always the most controversial proposals. Um, and those ones will go through, you know, those are the ones I've also been involved in. So, you know, those are the ones where we end up sitting until three in the morning or, or six in the morning, um, because there are very different views amongst different member states about what the role of the UN should be, what we should get involved in, what we shouldn't, how much money we should have, et cetera. So those are consistently, I would say, probably the most controversial. Depending on other issues, you know, a particular thematic topic might become, become contentious as well, because anything, anything that's discussed in the other committees, so again, you might have a human rights issue or a disarmament issue discussed in a different committee, if it involves any kind of funding requirement, <laughs> any kind of resources to it, um, it will go back to the fifth committee. And so back to, again, that's where both the thematic as well as the, the money elements come together. So that's, that's what tends to make the process so complicated. Thank you. I'm not sure I can see any other hands. If not, maybe we move on and then later we'll come back to it. So, Sebastian. Perfect. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, do you guys hear me? Yes, all right. Now let me move to the next challenge. Uh, let me present my screen. You see my screen? Good. I cannot see you, but uh, if I don't hear complaints, I'll go ahead. So first of all, thank you very much for this, uh, yeah, for the possibility to represent and present what is happening in the um, space of decentralized autonomous organizations that uh, Viviana has in her introduction already um, introduced. So um, I will talk a little bit about some showcases and about how governance looks like in reality in this early time. Uh, before I start, I would uh, want to delineate this a little bit from uh, a lot of the fairly noisy activities that we see going on in the crypto space. So um, I know that there's a lot of hype, there's a lot of noise in the space. Still, uh, I would like, I know there's people probably also in this audience who are rightly skeptical of what's going on. Um, I would focus the attention on, for the first time, having the ability to, in reality, experiment with really large governance experiments that were previously entirely impossible. I'll showcase some of these uh, governance experiments that we and other people in this space are doing. Uh, that I think are really tremendously interesting uh, when we think about, as Vienna, Viviana put it in the introduction, from a Trekkie's perspective of, you know, what is this future of um, governance? Or, as we say in a highly meme-driven space, it's all about coordination and a little bit of surprise. So, 
To jump into the first showcase, I will talk about a blockchain infrastructure project uh, that is called Gnosis Chain. So it is its own uh, closed ecosystem, which um, is highly technical in nature, but which is also uh, managing a lot of funds. In this case, it is managing about half a billion dollar worth of liquid assets. So for a startup that has been around for five years, that is a tremendous success. But it's also, of course, a tremendous weight on the shoulders of those that have to make decisions. And um, yeah, so therefore, we will look a little bit at the, um, yeah, at, at the decision making processes. And what we've heard in the previous, uh, I, I was pretty interested in this previous uh, presentation on what sort of steps and procedures go through uh, people go through when they have these um, yeah these these meetings that are very labor intensive so i guess here we started out in these technical projects that need governance from this perspective well can we just take technology to increase efficiencies of these governance or consensus finding exercises and I think I can, can say that already ahead of time. Many times what we do see is it still needs a human component. And that is where it gets actually very interesting. So let's look into the governance um, process and structures of this Gnosis ecosystem. So in this Gnosis ecosystem, a governance process is fairly formally um, defined with several steps that are uh, carried out after one another. Everything starts in what they call an ideation process. So it is open-ended and it's a um, yeah, largely unstructured discussion that happens in a forum. So you might have a great idea of where you want to um, develop this uh, technical infrastructure further, how you might want to spend funds or how we can um, change even the governance process itself. So it's an informal discussion um, that basically transitions to the next phase whenever the author of this post in a forum decides that some momentum has been reached. So you can abandon it at any time. Um, afterwards, it moves to a little bit more formal phase, which is called a specification phase. And that lasts for at least five days. And it also happens in a forum where people can um, not just discuss, but in this stage um, have a poll. So it's a simple yes, no poll. Do I want to go ahead with this or not? And with this, uh, during this uh, second specification phase, as the name suggests, people are specifying further questions in this proposal and are filling out a um, formal Gnosis improvement proposal. So this, what is called GIP, is something that is in one way or another adopted by multiple projects in the space, that you have some improvement proposals um, that are based on the first project that really started this Cambrian explosion of um, projects that grew this crypto or Web3 space called Bitcoin. Bitcoin itself has the Bitcoin improvement proposal process where different proposals um, are being discussed and ultimately uh, very few of them do get implemented. So Gnosis being a much younger project, being more agile, as we will see uh, in a minute, has more proposals and a much faster decision-making process than, for example, Bitcoin. The uh, last phase in this, in this uh, decision-making process is a actual voting process that lasts at least seven days. And during these seven days, uh, people are actually casting votes, which are uh, weighted by the number of tokens uh, that a voter holds on their balance. And you can see that in analogy to share corporations, when share corporations go, come together for their uh, annual general assembly or any extraordinary assemblies, um, members of these or shareholders, more specifically of share corporations, do vote on certain topics. Um, but we're trying here now to use the nature of these decentralized um, technologies to do this on an ongoing and less rigid basis. 
So although, as you can already tell from the timeline here, this is not necessarily very fast, it is something that can happen on an ongoing basis um, and not just once a year, as is the case typically for most share corporations. So um, yeah, the additional requirement that they have here is a yes quorum of at least 4% of their um, entire outstanding amount of tokens. So to put this into perspective, the uh, market capitalization of this project is around half a billion dollar. So that uh, gives at least some dollar amount of value that has to participate in a decision. And that is primarily to ensure that there's no um, kind of contentious votes that are being pushed through without the consent of at least some uh, fraction of the, of the shareholders of, um, of this project. Um, now, to give you a bit of feeling for how this looks like, um, I picked out one, um, one proposal here. And it is actually a Gnosis improvement proposal that changes the governance process itself. So this is actually, uh, you might remember from step, from step three down here that a 4% yes quorum is required uh, before a proposal um, is finalized and will be implemented. So this was changed from 10% down to 4%. So uh, the participants here can, uh, can basically have time to discuss it. So you see a, a discussion in a forum where participants discuss the pros and cons before moving to a second stage of the specification stage where in this case, there is a um, simple uh, poll in the forum that also has notably the option make no changes. And again, there's discussions, there's potential refinements, and then there is this, uh, there's this voting phase, which is one person, one vote um, happening in this ongoing process. And finally, we have a, a voting process, which is weighted by the participation. So by the Gnosis tokens, in short, GNO, um, that are having a say and had a balance of these tokens at a respective point in time. So what you see on this page is again, a short description, what is going on link to the discussion. And then since this is passed, so this happened at the end of 2020, uh, was ongoing for a bit over a week. You can see uh, how everybody voted. You can see how many, uh, what was their token balance that they used to vote for and, and how they voted. So this was apparently uh, a very straightforward thing. It was something that there was large agreement for. So there was not a huge amount of, um, yeah, discrepancy. So it was unanimous, yes. But that's not the only thing that uh, is being voted upon. To give you some feelings for things that um, are actually, that were actually voted upon is uh, we saw interestingly some mergers. So we see different projects merging together. So despite the fact that there is again, no share corporation involved, there's no shareholder meetings, this is all happening through these governance processes. Similarly, and that's why I picked this example of Gnosis chain, there has been also the opposite. There has been a spin-off. Um, that was a little bit more uh, debate there because you know we're spinning something out that is of value into its own entity, which might mean that we're losing value. So there was certainly discussion around that. Um, yeah, there was something that was, was even more contentious and, and really uh, yeah, leading to sometimes heated discussions, which is, should we uh, effectively bail out some projects which were subject to losing funds because of some software issues? And yeah, there were some interesting discussions, um, yet it was good to see that this governance process on a high level uh, yeah, was, was functioning for, um, for such discussions. Um, a quick second showcase is an application running on such a blockchain and I picked the Uniswap exchange. Uh, I find Uniswap very interesting because it's really one of the most popular applications that are running on a blockchain. It is a decentralized exchange. And just to appreciate a little bit how far this, this such applications have come, the trading volume of Uniswap yesterday, I just checked the numbers for yesterday, was a little bit larger than the total uh, trading volume on the uh, Swiss stock exchange uh, here yesterday. 
admittedly Swiss stock exchange is not New York or London, but still it's a fairly significant um, it's a fairly significant piece of uh, financial infrastructure which has in a traditional world the Swiss stock exchange shareholders of all major Swiss banks and yeah is uh, admittedly not the most innovative and fast moving thing. So on comes a startup that three years in has the same trade volume which can be transparently accounted for every single cent that has been traded there yesterday. So the governance process here is a little bit more involved with the focus on community engagement. So we see that there uh, an inherent part of this governance process is you have to present your proposal to the entire community. You have to undergo a temperature check vote where you need um, at least 25,000 uni tokens. So that's a value of uh, roughly a million dollars uh, saying yes. So this is only a temperature check vote before uh, we're undergoing more in-depth um, discussions and refinements, uh, followed by a consensus check vote. Um, so after this consensus check vote, a proposal has to be in its final form before passed in an on-chain vote, which requires a relatively decent amount of 10 million uh, uni tokens, which is uh, over $100 million to uh, start this start this vote and finally and also this is kind of interesting if we're thinking about highly autonomous infrastructure um, this becomes effective might become effective immediately and that's not good because you could actually use a governance process to attack the product and in this case to attack the product to potentially extract a huge amount of money again yesterday uh, this four and a half billion dollar that was traded there is directly exposed to this governance process. So in order to prevent an attack through governance, um, which is a pattern that we've seen for some other projects, there is a deliberate two days delayed execution. Good, and finally, I want to give a brief overview about some um, of the experimentation that we've done here at Hopper. So we are a young project that is around for two years building privacy infrastructure for the private relaying of information. And one interesting thing is how do you bootstrap such an ecosystem? And how we bootstrapped it is by leveraging the loyal community of uh, members who have been helping us ahead of our start, who've been helping us by testing our software and involving them in a, uh, in a governance process. So this process is working a little bit different than what I described before and is inspired by these Swiss referendums where you have to collect basically a certain number of signatures before going through a uh, public voting process. And here, interestingly, we had a one address, one vote, similar to how most uh, democracies work where there's one person, one vote. Um, yeah, we used a similar tool to what I've showcased before. I'll skip over that. It basically just shows that we had a um, decent amount of participation for uh, being a young project in this space. Um, we did another experiment where we refined the, the process a little bit um, and we changed to a one token, one vote, very similar to what we've seen before. And what was interesting here is that uh, in, in this process, we had larger voters which were having a huge influence in the outcome of the result. That was not necessarily, at least in our opinion, uh, for the betterment of the project. And that brings us to an interesting dilemma of really who has a say or who has how much of a say. If you say one person, one vote, well, you only have so much to say. Maybe large investors should have a larger say, but maybe not as much as in one token, one vote. And so the last thing that I want to talk about is a finding a new middle ground between one person, one vote, as is the case in many democracies, and one dollar, one vote, as is the case in most share corporations. And that is quadratic voting. So quadratic voting is effectively a means that tries to balance these two extreme ends of spectrum of voting 
So the number of votes that you have does not linearly increase, but actually only increases with the square root of a balance that you have. And uh, is thereby, if you think about it mathematically, somewhere a, a new middle ground. And yeah, what we also leveraged here is we want to incentivize the community not to vote, but to participate and think about um, what, is, what is really needed. And our conclusion this far has been, uh, as I've been hinting at in the introduction, well, technology is unfortunately not solving all issues of governance, but it might help make some of the processes less rigid. And ultimately, we do need processes. And we um, yeah, now have the possibility to use these blockchain-based uh, communities to really do experimentation of modern governance processes. And that's something that I'm very grateful for, that we have this ability to do such things and yeah, push the boundary further. And maybe at some point, we find something that works that helps maybe also the larger established organizations on the planet. Finally, just an outlook for the people who say, hey, this DAO topic sounds interesting. There's a huge landscape of various DAOs out there from protocol DAOs, like some of the ones that I've been presenting over uh, social communities, investment club DAOs, grant distribution. So how do we distribute funds? Uh, service DAOs, if you want to effectively have a new model of hiring an agency or hiring this more loosely organized communities to kind of collection DAOs. So collecting digital art and managing the collections of digital art is something that uh, in the recent wave of this uh, NFT madness that is currently ongoing is uh, pretty interesting, seeing the interplay between art, between governance and between technology. I think I went a little bit over time here, but that was my uh, short introduction. I'm happy to answer any questions right now or later on. Alice, please. Thank you, Sebastian. That was fascinating. Uh, I, I have one question about improvement projects. Uh, the target of an, imp or the, let's say the product of an improvement project is software? Not necessarily. So um, these, these uh, improvement proposals can be purely on a product level where uh, so there's, there's some projects which, which take it to an extreme end. It might be purely, for example, marketing. We want to go to a conference and we need budget for that. Um, can we allocate budget for that? That is a typical thing. It can also be very much software, yes. But it can also be, um, as, as in this first example, a change in the governance process itself. We want to change a quorum, right? So we basically have this constitution which says we need 10% of, um, of a quorum. We want to change that to 4% that did require a governance process. But yes, the majority of the uh, improvement proposals that are being made are somewhat technical in nature. Um, I, I'm just quite struck by many the, par the many parallels to open source software communities, and it, uh, yeah, that is not that is not by coincidence. So I didn't talk about this, but this uh, like crypto and Web three ecosystem is very much building on the ethos of free and open source software that it that it is actually deeply rooted in. So all of the things that I've shown here is free and open source software. And uh, yeah, therefore, unsurprisingly, also deeply inspired by these processes, now augmented with abilities that a token, a digital coin or a token actually brings us. That's fascinating. Thank you. Sebastian, yeah, indeed, those uh, experiments, the three types of experiments you run are fascinating. I want to follow up um, with one statement you mentioned earlier that you uh, like the results from the first two experiments were not endorsed by the association or you. So I'm wondering how do you and your association 
evaluate the um, decision quality? Yeah, that's uh, that's a difficult question, and it's walking a line uh, because it's a very fine line between uh, ensuring that proposals are in line with the goals of the association. So our core values are privacy and free and open source software. Uh, so, for example, if uh, we we sometimes have funny proposals where people propose, well, give all the money into my own pocket, right? So that is relatively clear. So there we, um, when on, on the transition phase between the uh, individual things, we are just, uh, we're, we're just not transitioning that. Um, this very young, uh, maybe very much uh, in contrast to this much in depth discussion of the UN that we've seen before, uh, ecosystem is running into quirky situations all the time. I give you one example that we were directly impacted by uh, just a few weeks ago. There was a software issue that needed fixing. It was largely not contentious. It was largely, we all agreed it needs fixing, but it needed to undergo a governance process. Now that presents a dilemma. Do you break software and make people lose money or do you break the governance process that you set kind of set in stone? And yeah, it's, it's a very interesting dilemma, right? So in, in this case, it was in this Gnosis ecosystem. Um, people decided to start this governance process, but kind of implement the situation as soon as it was fairly obvious that um, there was a strong consensus for the change. Um, yeah, but in our case, uh, we do have some guidelines in place. Uh, that we, you know, want to ensure that we don't vote on things which are not in line with the goals of the project. Very interesting trade-off. I think uh, next Jerry has a lot to say also regarding this trade-off. Jerry, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Hold on. Let me share my screen. Okay. All right. Very, very good uh, morning and afternoon and also evening to you. Uh, this is Jared. I'm currently in Singapore right now. It's 9.37 p.m. Um, really much uh, happier to be sharing about this uh, uh, project uh, instead of uh, grading my exams, <laughs> which is this uh, exam grading period and grade submission time. So uh, without further ado, let me go into uh, the presentation. Uh, so the title is kind of giving it uh, away, but uh, I'm trying to show you some experimental evidence of lower cooperation that we find among uh, resource recipients in consensus-based organizations. I just want to acknowledge this project uh, with my collaborators, uh, Farnish, Professor Farnish Puranam, I saw that he's here uh, for this session. I actually changed some of the labels, but because I saw that Farnish is here, I changed it back to his labels. <laughs> Farnish, uh, and Professor Reddy Kota uh, from SMU and uh, my advisor, Jane Narayanan from NUS. So uh, we have heard about the, uh, all the other practical approaches of uh, uh, resource allocation, both in the UN, in DAO, uh, but very, very broadly, right, uh, this program research, uh, we are looking at uh, how resource allocation the structures can actually impact um, exposed cooperation. But just going to a brief overview, right, uh, um, organizations often have to decide on how they split uh, resources among alternatives in terms of capital budgeting or selecting projects, staffing projects, or strategy making. But the issues that's involved would be a dispersion of information and divergence of interest among uh, resource claimants. That makes it difficult to attain uh, optimal allocation. So the traditional solution uh, as what we're very used to is uh, what we call the hierarchical resource uh, allocation, whereby the superior makes the decision on how to allocate resources, right, based on input from their subordinates. Um, the superior is that naturally incentivized to make allocation in the interest of the organization and takes into account all the information losses uh, and, and distortions uh, due to lobbying by the subordinates in order to increase the uh, allocation to themselves. 
However, an alternative, uh, and which we have uh, heard uh, today, right, uh, would be the consensus-based approach, consensus resource allocation, or what we've seen in uh, those decentralized uh, organizations where subordinates jointly make the allocation by consensus and the superior or the CEO is merely a rubber stamp that approves whatever the subordinates uh, or the work team decides. Right, and, and past research have uh, suggested that uh, the feelings of empowerment, a greater uh, process fairness and, and cohesion as a result of this process should lead to greater exposed cooperation among the uh, resource recipients. Uh, some examples uh, that we all know, uh, Valve, uh, which is a, a bossless organization or the decentralized organization, which allows the subordinates to make their own decisions on what projects to join and to work on. And some of the supposed benefits of uh, consensus-based uh, uh, organizing uh, or, or decentralization would be uh, greater engagement and cooperation among the employees. Uh, greater voluntary uh, contribution of effort, but we don't really have an uh, idea why uh, exactly this happens because uh, there could be self-selection issues that uh, people who are naturally more willing to or have a proclivity to cooperate with others would self-select into these sort of organizations. Or it could be that uh, those that uh, uh, cooperated more were uh, more likely to survive right and essentially there is a lack of uh, uh, data or empirical data on comparison with centralized centralized uh, organizations or what we call the hierarchical based uh, traditional systems which leads us to our research question on how does consensus or hierarchical decision-making process in resource allocation affect the level of ex post cooperation among resource recipients. And some open questions, right, would be the uh, a process of going through uh, having consensus in fact lead to greater exposed cooperation? Um, or is the difference between the hierarchical and consensus-based uh, structures primarily in the opportunities for interactions among subordinates? And, and in uh, Approaching this, uh, investigating this research question, we also looked at some of the potential uh, mediators and mechanisms of a procedural justice, cohesion, uh, and distributive justice, and if, whether these explains uh, ex post cooperation. So we want to um, scientifically, experimentally study this by comparing uh, the traditional hierarchical resource allocation structure versus the consensus-based resource allocation structure and the random assignment so that we can um, tease out the uh, causal effects of co consensus on ex post cooperation. Uh, we have variants of each of these uh, uh, structures that allow or do not allow interaction among subordinates, but I'm going to focus on uh, the variant that, that allows interactions. And then we measure the uh, mechanisms, which are uh, procedural justice, distributive justice, and group cohesion. The experimental design. In the first part, we adapted the uh, capital budgeting task from Badule um, to group decisions. We focused on, we actually assign our participants into groups of four individuals, randomly assigned into the roles of three divisional managers or a CEO in a corporation with three divisions. So the task is that each division or divisional manager uh, requesting for $60 million in funding for projects that have a positive uh, net present value. But these divisions vary in their profitability index, and which is known to all the divisional managers, but not to the uh, CEOs. We do not focus on uh, synergies across divisions. So in total, every divisional manager is incentivized with actual cash uh, um, that's related to their outcomes. Uh, they, would, they would be asking for 180 million, which is uh, 60 into three. But the company or the CEO has only a limited budget of $100 million to allocate across the projects. So uh, they would have been, the participants would have been trained uh, in how to do the optimal allocation and 
um, the allocation, the optimal allocation in this case would be 60, 40, 0. 60 to the most profitable uh, division for the remaining 40 million to the second most profitable and 0 to the last uh, division. So the divisional managers are incentivized to get as much allocation for the division as possible. We actually told them that for every 10 million um, uh, of budget that they get allocated, they would be they would receive a, a dollar in cash on top of their show up fee. Whereas the CEO is incentivized to uh, identify the optimal allocation. If they identify the optimal allocation, they would receive a, a cash uh, incentive as well. So the setup of the study in the first stage, the divisional managers would uh, prepare their requests to the CEO. They would interact with each other and then they would pitch to the CEO on why they should deserve the allocation that they're asking for. That's for stage two. And then lastly, in stage three, the CEO would recommend a allocation uh, budget across the three divisions. The difference being that in the hierarchical resource allocation uh, condition, the CEO decision final and binding. Whereas in the consensus resource allocation uh, condition, the divisional managers have to come to a consensus on how much each of them would receive, uh, provided that the total, the sum of that amount results in uh, below 100 million, 100 million or, or, or lower. Otherwise, all of them would receive zero. So in this case, we are uh, kind of forcing them to come to a consensus. But so they all have to agree uh, on the allocation or else they would receive no budget. Whereas in the hierarchical uh, condition, they discuss and then they just pitch to the, they do not have to come to a consensus. They pitch to the uh, CEO why they should receive an amount and the CEO decides. I just want to uh, pause here and, and check if um, I need to clarify if uh, any of the experimental condition. Or maybe let me proceed and, and come back to questions again. Okay. So that's the first part. In the second part, um, we then debrief the CEO. So to test the ex post cooperation, we get the divisional managers to play a public goods game. But here we put the uh, we tell them to that uh, um, they have they now receive a budget of six units for every round, and they can choose to invest all of these six units in a set of collaborative projects, which produces a synergistic payoff, or they can choose to hold on to it and keep the um, the the six units of uh, budget for themselves. Okay, so across three rounds, they would submit their choices simultaneously without communication with each other. And then at the end of the round, they would, they would be informed of how much they uh, actually receive based on this uh, structure over here, right? So as with uh, most public goods game, if everyone contributes, then you get you receive the uh, most number, the greatest number of uh, shared payoff, which is 12 minutes each, right? And that would be... 36 units, but um, if you do not contribute, then that's where you individually get the most. Okay, so this is um, how we measure exposed cooperation, which is commonly used uh, as a, a operationalization of cooperation. Let me skip this. This is some of the measures for the mediators. And let me go straight into the um, study sample and the results. We ran three studies, but I just want to draw your attention to study two and three uh, over here, HRA uh, interaction, the CRA interaction. We have, this is the variance uh, without the I are the variance without interaction. Here are the results. So in terms of cooperation, uh, if I draw attention to here, the inter interaction conditions. So it, the difference between interaction and uh, no interaction is that uh, we do not allow the divisional managers to interact with each other in the no interaction condition. But let's ignore that for now and let's focus on HRA interaction and consensus uh, uh, interaction. We find that across two studies, um, there is in one study, we have a statistically significant result that in the consensus resource allocation, 
condition, there was actually a lower levels of cooperation. So if you see here, mean is 2.01 versus uh, in HRA, hierarchical is 2.44. We attempted to replicate the result again, thinking that something might be wrong. We would expect that it, under consensus, they should uh, have greater um, cooperation. But again, we find a pattern trending towards lower cooperation in the consensus condition, even though the result here is not uh, statistically significant, but because we were running this at the tail end of the study pool uh, in SMU, we did not manage to achieve our uh, targeted sample size of uh, close to 24 or 25 groups per condition. In study three, we only had 19 groups. In terms of procedural justice, um, we do mostly find that the consensus condition is higher. Um, no difference in distributive, distributive justice. Uh, and we find higher levels of cohesion in consensus condition. So strangely, the higher levels of perceived cohesion did not translate to greater levels of cooperation. So here is the summary of the findings again. Uh, we found that naturally in consensus resource allocation, there were more equal allocations among the claimants. There was a greater sense of procedural justice, greater sense of cohesion than hierarchical resource allocation, but not greater exposed cooperation. We ran a meta-analysis across the three studies and it shows that the cooperation in the hierarchical condition was actually higher than in the consensus condition. We have some speculations. Uh, we do not have conclusive evidence of why. Uh, uh, we think that perhaps uh, the time pressure the, that the participants face uh, in the consensus condition may have forced them to come to a compromise or may have led them to experience greater depletion or exhaustion. And that led to a lower cooperation in the uh, exposed uh, uh, round. Or it could be that the um, need for compromise and the comp consensus-based structure may have limited motives to cooperate once that structure is removed because we call that uh, we move them from one setup to the other and from the and after the resource allocation uh, exp uh, um, task, uh, they move on to the public goods game and the CEO is now no longer part of that uh, setup. So perhaps it could be that um, under consensus resource allocation, even though they receive equal amounts, uh, there would be someone who is, feels that they should receive a lot more, right? And, and then, um, but in the, uh, sorry, this should be HRA, okay, uh, not CRA. In the, in the hierarchical resource allocation, uh, allocation condition, they could have blamed it on the uh, CEO who made the decision instead of their peers, because in consensus, it's the peers that forced me to receive a lower amount. So we are planning to run one more study, um, which is comparing across hierarchical uh, consensus and a hybrid condition. So if I can walk you through this, uh, because note that in between the hierarchical and the consensus condition, we have basically two moving parts. First, the decision made by the CEO versus decision made by the group in consensus. Second, uh, there's no consensus in hierarchical condition, whereas in consensus, there is a consensus. So in this hybrid condition, we intend to get the, uh, make it such that the CEO still makes the final allocation and that is binding. But the uh, participants, the division managers have to come to a consensus on how they pitch to the uh, CEO. And therefore we can then test uh, for which, what's, the contributing factor that leads to the difference in cooperation. Is it the process of going through a consensus or is it the presence of the uh, CEO that, that they can attribute the blame to? Thank you. I think I've taken 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Really interesting results. Do we have any questions from the audience? Yes, Oscar. Hi, Oscar. Sorry, this must be the, the okay. sixth time or tenth time you have heard this. Oh, <laughs> this is actually the first time I'm hearing this study. So. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, I, I thought, uh, yeah, you were there when Farnish so presented. Okay. So I was wondering what information, um, how the hierarchical and the consensus procedures differed in the kind of information that is revealed throughout the process to the DMs. So is it that the profitability for each division is private uh, in no. both conditions? Is, if it is private, then does it get revealed during the interaction? And so, and um, per, I wonder if that would have made a difference. So, so we we in in prior in earlier versions we have done uh, uh, private information uh, and that did not have an effect. Uh, in this uh, two studies, uh, three studies that I presented, there was uh, full information. So they, they were all aware of the profitability uh, in the indices of the other divisions. Only the CEO is not aware. Thank you, Oskar. Thank you. Yes, Andreas. Oh, thank you. Uh, and thanks for that study. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing if you get data on how decisions are made because that's that's our daily reality. The, the one thing that would be interesting for me is if you have done that already or if you're planning to also do this research in loops because we know that previous experience impacts future behavior. So th that mm. would just be an, an, an interesting aspect to learn more about for right. me. Right. Uh, at the moment, we are not uh, looking at that. So, so we recognize that um, that there is a reputation effect. There's learning, uh, and when, when the moment you know how your peers are behaving in a previous round and how that impacts uh, subsequent. So we are we are not looking at all of that because we just we want to really isolate and and target mm -hmm. uh, the the process of whether. Um, in going through uh, one time, right, uh, a hierarchical system versus a consensus system, what leads to differences, and and going through loops may then complicate the process, and then we have to account for learning, uh, because there could also be individual differences in the way they behave, um, not just in the allocation but also in the cooperation parts. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Andreas. And related to Andreas' uh, question, is making decisions in the loops is not only learning from the past, there is also the shadow of the future that will create yes. an interesting effect. Um, yes, that's right, in anticipation. Yeah. Right, right. Ah, I think, yes, that's right. Uh, in, so um, rather, if I know that I will not be interacting with the person again, then, then that, will, uh, that, may, that may affect uh, uh, the way I behave. Right, got it, yes. We can open um, the, uh, the, to the audience general questions if you have any comments and questions regarding the prior presentations, please also feel free. Actually, I have a question to Jared for this very interesting presentation. So I'm not from that field of research. So that's why my, my question may be, may be a bit naive. Um, you were concluding uh, basically on the power, the coordinating power of the CEO. Uh, I would have kind of intuitively said, well, the CEO might have been overruling the selfishness of individual participants. Isn't, isn't that another view of, of this thing? Or how did, you it is. how did you attribute kind of coordinating power to the, to the CEO? Uh, yeah, I would I would say yes. They in the hierarchical condition, uh, the CEO is precisely overruling the um, selfish uh, intents. But the thing is, then we would uh, presume that the yeah, or rather compared to the um, consensus condition we would think that by forcing them to come to consensus, yes, they could be selfish, but then they, they are um, working, they are fulfilling mutual interests. Uh, because, it, and what we see in the, in the uh, hierarchical condition is a lot of unequal allocations. So uh, there's always someone who gets very little. And pre we, 
uh, the, the, the formal hypothesis would be that uh, they would not be happy and therefore they would not cooperate as much with each other. But surprisingly, we find the opposite. I understood that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for this explanation, Jared. It's really Thank interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. Yes, Kellis. Hi, Kellis. I think you're still muted. Technology, always, always a, a, a challenge. Yes. Uh, I want to come back to something that came up uh, in uh, um, Sebastian's um, talk about the quirky situation and the trade-off of speed of execution versus gaining consensus. And uh, first, first of all, I want to put a plea out there because I have recently said that in a paper and I was looking for some confirmation, some, some data that uh, actually said, yes, it takes, uh, there's tons of anecdotal evidence that consensus takes longer, uh, but I'm not aware of any formal studies that consensus takes longer. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's a very important point. Uh, so so this, this is just a plea uh, for uh, the um, experimentalists and, and the, uh, but, but also the other scientists out there to uh, uh, make that a headline item in, in your uh, data collection and results. Um, but uh, I, I was also fascinated by the workaround uh, that, uh, well, you, you as, it, it's sort of like uh, in drug studies when they, when they break the study early, when, when the results are coming in really well. Uh, and uh, I, I thought that was also very fascinating. Um, but I, it, it appears that, that um, slowness is, is a burden you bear. Uh, Viviana said it in the chat, <laughs> freedom is an endless meeting and no resolution, you know, no, no resolution until some forcing function like uh, Christmas and everybody going on break comes along, which was Katya's point. Anyway, I, I, I just wanted to, uh, uh, that, that seemed to be a theme across uh, all, all three presentations and I think it's an important one. Yeah, uh, Carissa, to follow up there. Uh, so first of all, I would uh, first of all invite all researchers here to like look in these DAO topics. It's a treasure trove of publicly available data. We are trying all we can to make this data as public and as accessible as is somehow possible. And uh, yeah, so it's just so early and so chaotic, but there's yet a lot going on with real money at stake. So I think it's just really interesting. I'm, I'm always waiting for, you know, people to like really dig into all these doubts because it's already so much that I'm trying to uh, now also before this talk, try to stay on top of a lot of things. It's really, it starts being hard. So uh, I think that is, that is very interesting. And especially these, uh, as you mentioned, these, these quirks and kind of um, things we have to break something. Uh, there's a lot of that happening. So due to the nature of the technology very early, and due to the nature of these specific forms of governance being fairly experimental in not very educated um, environments, uh, yeah, there's if, if you're interested in edge cases, there's probably even more. Kati? Um, so I, I was actually going to ask a similar question. I mean, again, Carlos, to your point, the UN would, as far as I know, just be an anecdotal example. But but I would argue, you know, much as as people often complain that we're slow, that, that is the reason that we are slow is because we we not just in the budget, but um, generally prefer decision making by by consensus. Um, so I think both from Sebastian and and Jared's presentation, I mean, I find that the parallels quite interesting, and I can see exactly some of these tensions between say a hierarchical system, which in the case of the UN, the intergovernmental bodies is actually a bit confusing because the secretary general 
is really not the CEO. He's he's the member states are very clear. He's the chief administrative officer. So, you know, so so we don't even have that option of a hierarchy. For us, the hierarchy starts to come through in terms of the larger member states, right? And so we see last week there has been a lot of debate in the General Assembly around the veto in the Security Council, right? And and so the countries that hold the veto power in the Security Council, in some ways might see themselves as more of a CEO, right? But but that's exactly where I think a number of other member states and, and as the General Assembly voted, they're concerned about that. So there's, I can see from the studies, the logic of how we very naturally moved to a consensus-based um, decision-making process. And I think that would be the only way it would ever work um, when you're dealing with 193 member states. And so I wanted to actually pick up on, on I think it was a comment by, by Jared or, um, Viviana as well, just to make sure I understood correctly that the, about, you know, the willingness to compromise is also affected a little bit by the fact it, whether there might be more continued engagement. So, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm thinking at it from the UN context, but if they know they're coming back every year together to continuously approve the budget, it does resonate with me. There, there is a logic there, and and you can see it in how the decision making and the trade offs are made. You know, we gave you a trade off last year. This year, you owe me. You know, and that kind of thing. So, I just wanted to sort of see if you could elaborate a little bit more on that point. Is this a question to me or to Jared? Uh -huh. Maybe Jared, you go ahead first. Sorry, I, I just want to understand the, the, the question a little bit more. So it's it's about um, recognizing that I'm continuous with collaboration. The... Yeah, whether the, the continuous, so if you're in a relationship, you know, I mean, if I understood your experiments correctly, Jared, because I think yes. I think it was you who said it, but you know, feel free to correct me. But you know, yours essentially they were in this experiment, it was a finite experiment, and then they left. So there wasn't yes. necessarily you know, a sense that they're coming back with the same group and need to compromise again, which, you know, um, so is, is, is there, can you measure essentially that there is an impact on how the willingness to compromise, I guess, increases if you're in that continued relationship year after year, as opposed to it's a one-off? Right. Um, so I think two parts to this question, right? I, I mean, in terms of, whether it's possible to measure, yes, of course, uh, it is possible to measure, but I think it's more importantly, oh, right, as in you're saying whether they are aware uh, or, or whether they have in mind uh, whether they will be interacting with the, with yep. the person. Yeah, I, I guess we have not looked at that. We presume that uh, they would not because we, we briefed them and we told them that you there are these two parts, the resource allocation activity uh, and, and then an expose uh, task. Uh, and we told them that uh, that's the end. So I would imagine that uh, almost all of them should have the notion that they would not be interacting with these people uh, again. But if I think you're alluding to uh, if it's a situation where they would be going through the process uh, multiple times, then, then would they actually behave differently? Yeah. Um, possibly. Possibly. The, especially in the consensus uh, model, perhaps. I can see why they may uh, increase their cooperation uh, because they know that they would, have, they would be dealing with this person again. Um, but if in our case, because it's the end and, and, and perhaps they feel unhappy that uh, they did not receive their fair share, so e e equality and equity are different, right? Um, and that's where they sort of uh, reduce their cooperation because it was finite. Yeah, I yeah, think Viviana, it definitely right can, be, um, can be tested uh, in experimental design. Mm. And I think the beauty of this panel is we can see different ways of uh, experimentation done either in the lab um, or in Sebastian's case, 
um, with a real money in a stake with a group of uh, a community of uh, real people participating. So this type of field, we, we can call it field or a quasi experiment that Sebastian has been doing. And they have shown us very interesting trade-offs between different ways of uh, decision-making. We have seen the many drawbacks for consensual decision-making, for example, slow speed and uh, even regarding quality, we are not sure whether it is producing higher quality of decision. And from Jerry's findings, we are also not sure whether it's always going to lead to better cooperation However, this is a very important type of decision-making um, process, not only because we perhaps are hardwired to prefer this way of um, governance structure, but also more importantly, because this is a government's governance structure um, that's critical for curbing the power, uh, the centralized power that might actually be um, one day saving us from disastrous uh, consequence associated with a, a completely centralized governance structure. And then I think at least for me, the takeaway is for us to continue um, our um, effort and investment in better understanding this consensus decision-making process and try to find ways to improve it um, through very scientific research design and through engaging with uh, practitioners in the field um, like Kati and uh, Sebastian. Um, so this is um, my part and I hope this can continue to, um, in generating many discussions and debates among us in this community as well. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Thank you. <laughs>